Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This video is going to be titled something like 10 plants that won't move and it'll probably confuse people until they've clicked on it and I've told you why. Uh, we are going to do a lot of rearranging in this garden next year, some redesign. Uh, the front of the house has got new siding and a new porch and there's going to be some additional painting going on over here. Uh, once that's settled out, we're going to be able to do a new foundation planting and maybe use some of the existing material and some things just have to move around uh, just in being redesigned. So it should be a fun uh, 2024 out here in the garden in the spring, just moving things around and talking through design things. But there's some plants that just definitely won't move. The Autumn Brilliant Service Berry is definitely one of those. It's finally really taken off. I get questions all the time about how it's looking and you can see right now it's really kind of come into its own uh, this season. There's a few limbs up there that are crossing that need to be pruned this winter. So I'll do a, when we, when I get around to doing pruning videos in the late winter, the service berry will definitely be on the list. Uh, it's about to get fall color. Uh, last year we didn't really see any good fall color on it, uh, but I can already see some oranges showing up in it now, right here at the second day of October. By two, three weeks from now, it should have great, great fall color because it's been kept in good shape this whole season. It's got a slight lean to it that I'd also like to correct this winter once the foliage is dropped off of it. I have it staked. I'm going to restake it and try to pull it back this way just a little bit. It's not much off, but it's off enough that I can see uh, that it's definitely off. It's finally, I've had it staked the whole time because it, the caliper on it was just too small and it was too wispy. It's finally really built some caliper and a little bit of pruning out of the top of it. Next year, I should be able to take the stake off of it, I think, by summer or fall of next year. Number two plant definitely won't be moving is the first choice Caryopteris. It's in full bloom, uh, continues to just bloom and bloom and bloom. It's October 2nd. It's been blooming since midsummer. It's the perfect plant for this space. This low fence that was built out here in a video two years ago, uh, if you want to go back and watch how this fence was built, the, the strategy was to put something on the inside that would just barely above the fence and then rotate something, you know, on the other side, uh, further down that would you could see from the other side of the fence. And it's worked pretty well. I've got a couple things that are a little taller than I want, uh, but this, this one every year is just two years in a row has just gotten to the perfect height. So you can see it from that side uh, just enough. Uh, and then you can fully see it from this side. This will get cut down to about 12 to 18 inches in height once it goes February-ish, um, early March. And then that's how much it grew in a single season. And again, it started blooming a few flowers, probably back as far as June, just picked up momentum the whole time. And now the bees are on this thing. They were on it till dark last night, really later than they were on pretty much anything out here in the garden. Definitely the evergreen dogwood, the Chinese evergreen dogwood uh, definitely won't be, uh, wouldn't be moving. This is kind of a screen for us. We have this apartment thing across from us over here and it gives some, it offers some privacy to the garden. We kept things lower near the entry gate in the middle so we can see from the porch out anything that's happening. But when you're out here in the actual garden, it's nice to have a couple things, you know, that, that create, feel like they create some privacy, but without putting yourself in a prison or a hiding place for somebody to be, you know, doing something nefarious, right? Uh, so I don't want to create that space either. So it's a good, con it's a, a good middle ground to have a couple things that are taller. Plus, sometimes it's good to bring the height out from the house because we have so many houses now that are built on slab and, and the windows are very low. So it's hard to get height into a garden now uh, in a lot of cases because you're already starting with plants that are only this tall at the foundation. So sometimes coming way out from the house and adding something with some height uh, is a good idea. But this definitely won't be moving. It is budded up already. It will bloom. Uh, in the spring uh, for a very, very long time. It's later blooming than our native dogwoods. Once it starts, it blooms for way, way longer, uh, well into the summer. And then it develops these edible fruit uh, that are on it right now, uh, these red fruit. I never get quite as many of the red fruit as I see on some of the, like Kusa dogwoods uh, specifically. I see more of the fruit develop. Uh, so I don't know if that's a, a product of its age or what it is, but we do get some and they're decorative. They're, you know, red, these kind of like, red Christmas decorations on the evergreen dogwood. I say it's evergreen. It actually sheds most of its leaves as it's kind of re in the spring. And so it's, um, 
We would call this tardily deciduous, I think is what we would actually refer to it as. Most of the leaves drop off as new leaves are coming, so it gives the illusion almost uh, that, it's, uh, that it's completely evergreen. Next up is a Shasta viburnum. Uh, Shasta viburnum definitely won't be moving. I actually considered taking this plant completely out because it always wants to get wider. And this is such a small lot here in Raleigh, North Carolina as an urban, you know, small urban lot. And as we're picking plants and you want to, we, we're, you know, plant collectors and we want a lot of different plants, it's hard to accept one that will get 12 or 15 feet wide. It just is because it's just going to eat up so much space, even though it's a beautiful plant. So the solution has been to limit up. And that's allowed us to tuck a few things up under it and actually use the ground space that's under it and then accept the fact that it's going to be wider, taller. But we'll continue, I think, when it's dormant this winter, limit up just a bit more. I don't want to be doing any more pruning on the top of it when these uh, Shasta viburnum, there's some plants that just don't take kindly to pruning. And when you prune them, it almost sets them back more than a year, regardless of when you prune them and the Shasta viburnum definitely fits that. So the first year I tried to do some outer pruning on it and that just basically eliminated the flowers the next year. Then this past winter, I decided to limit up and not cut any of the top on it. That increased the flowers. So I won't do any pruning on the top except if I got a crazy limb I need to remove and I'll continue to limit up and I think we'll get it back to full flower and be able to access the ground uh, underneath it. This, uh, uh, Miss Kim Lilac also fits that category. Any general pruning you do on them tends to reduce the flowers for a couple of seasons uh, after that. So placing, you know, either one of these plants, placing them properly kind of is important because if you have to do any pruning on them every year, you're just gonna cut way back on the flowers that you have. Next up is the Rosalinda Indian Hawthorn that's been tree formed as well. So we have several things in the garden. We've worked on turning them into small uh, patio trees. Uh, this one will, get quite a bit bigger on the top as time goes and we'll thick, get the trunk thickened up and it will look more and more like a tree uh, as the years go on. One of the, this is just an incredible, absolutely incredible Indian hawthorn. Very large leaves, very large flowers, very fragrant flowers, very showy flowers. Marginally hardy here in the 7B garden in Raleigh. So we, this is a plant that we actually have a pretty big cover that a couple times this winter, this thing will almost certainly get a cover pulled over the top of it. Just, you know, just to protect the flower, the buds will start forming on them. This thing just doesn't have an off switch. It just continues to grow. I have noticed the one over at the JC Ralston Arboretum, which is a 15 foot tall and 15 foot wide specimen, maybe taller than that, takes virtually no damage during the winter time. And so I do think that as time goes on, these things really, as they get older and rooted in better and more established, they're less likely to get significant damage uh, in minor events uh, going forward. So I'm ready for that to happen because the last few winters, at least a few times during the winter, we have covered it just to make sure we see those flowers. Those flowers are so spectacular. Indian hawthorns always flower, but this one just is really special. And it's, again, it's incredibly fragrant. New growth on this thing is kind of a burgundy color as it's growing. And of course, even here in October, it wants to be growing. And that's where the damage kind of comes into play is that's where our flower buds are gonna be, you know, as the winter goes on, is in this growth that just keeps coming uh, all winter long. But Rosalinda's definitely not moving. Number six, we've moved around to the back garden. The windmill palm is definitely found its home uh, it's took, it takes a little while for these palms to really get going. Uh, and this year it's finally kind of taken off. The actual part of the palm that I, that we measure height on, uh, is the, you know, is the part down below. We're not really measuring height by these, you know, the leaves that are coming up down there. You can, it, this year it's probably added almost a foot of growth. Eventually it'll be up here to the corner of the, you know, up, up to the corner of the house is the goal, you know, is to have a big, um, tropical looking palm here in the garden and it's on its way. Uh, again, it took a year and a half or so uh, to get it going. Uh, it's amazing, it's in clay soil here. It's actually a little bit moist there uh, and it's just hit the ground running. Haven't had any winter damage on it. It's really hard to cover these. So even if I had some sort of event coming, it's just kind of on its own because the thing you would cover it with would probably just end up doing more damage to it. If it got any snow load on a cover on it, it would just, you know, do significant damage. Uh, so thus far, you know, it's in a well-protected space, but the windmill palm's definitely not moving. We have all these really interesting kind of one-of-a-kind plants out here. 
you know, from some, you know, friends from breeders. We have plants that haven't been released yet. We have plant, all kinds of really interesting collection of plants out here that have been given to us and all kinds of things. But the number one plant asked about on this channel is definitely this Carolina Midnight Laurapetalum, which is widely available. Uh, you, can, you can find this pretty easily, but anytime this is in the background, everybody wants to know what that purple bush is uh, behind me. Uh, it's enormous. Uh, it'll get about as big as you want to let it get. This one definitely needs a little bit of of tough love this wind. Uh, well, I'll wait till it blooms in the spring. I'll talk more about that in a second, but it needs some tough love. This one has the purple coloration throughout the plant. The old varieties of Laura Petalum that were originally picked for having these interesting dark foliage colors, you know, it was only in the new growth and then it, the old growth became green. And probably some of you have some of those in your, in your gardens, but the newer selections that we've seen, including purple daydream, which is a dwarf and we, we've seen the purple coloration stay in even the oldest growth. A little bit of green hue shows up in it, but it still has that coloration through the whole plant. And this is one of those varieties. Flowers on this one are almost red. Uh, they're in the honeysuckle family, so it's this frilly, interesting, interesting frilly flower. It's blooming now. Uh, it blooms heavily in the spring, and then it uh, uh, will, will bloom. When, it, when the nighttime temperature is cool in the fall, it's like another trigger, and it'll get a few flowers on it in the fall majority of the flowers uh, in the spring and right after it blooms in the spring this thing's really going to get cut hard didn't cut it year before last because it had a bird nest in it it was in a video i was about to prune it and it had had a bird's nest in it already a bird beat me to to it and then this past year i just didn't cut it hard enough i really need to cut it harder but one of the main reasons it's not moving is this is our line, direct line of sight into a neighbor that's very very close but it's created a really great border uh, and uh, made for a very, you know, more private space back here in our back garden. Number eight is the Stella Ruby Magnolia, mainly because I just wanted something with vertical growth in this bed so that other things could be planted around it. It could have been an upright narrow holly, could have been an upright narrow conifer, could have been an upright narrow, almost anything. Uh, just, uh, again, I'm trying the, the, trying to get height uh, out here in this garden, but it's, it's a Number one, it's a small garden, so I need things that stay kind of narrow. Uh, and, and then, you know, number two, planting anything right up against the, I just didn't have anywhere to plant anything right up against the house here. Uh, so this was just the perfect addition. It's grown quite a bit. I think it's probably up over nine feet uh, at this point. It will bloom heavily in the spring. F buds are on it now. It's shedding a few interior leaves. You'll see that on a lot of things in the fall, you know, that we consider evergreen. Uh, they will, you know, shed in the middle. You'll see conifers doing it. You'll see some of your leafy evergreen things. You'll see azaleas do it uh, this time of year. Uh, they'll lose some percentage of the oldest leaves right in the interior of the plant. When this blooms in the spring, if I wanted to, I think I could do a little bit of shearing on it if I wanted to keep it even narrower, but I haven't had to prune it. It hasn't had a blade on it since it went in the ground. Uh, it's in a slightly protected space. This um, banana shrub hybrid is in zone seven, probably a little bit vulnerable. So this is not a plant, even though it make a great screening plant in zone eight or nine, I think up in zone seven, it needs a slightly protected space where the wind isn't going to just whip across it all winter, but this is definitely not moving. Number nine on the list of plants that definitely wouldn't move and other things won't move uh, as well, but these are the things that hundred percent, they're gonna, they, they have found their home and we'll work around them. The Tokyo Tower Kyananthus here, uh, which is an upright, narrow version of the Chinese fringe tree. Uh, we have a great native fringe tree as well, but this is an upright, narrow version of the Chinese fringe tree. You can see how well it's fit into this space. We got kind of a line across here of some taller things. There's a Viburnum nudum uh, to my, you know, to this, the other side over there. There's uh, uh, white wedding hydrangeas. There's a Japanese maple way down there. There's a Japanese maple here. And the last plant we're gonna see is over there. We've kind of put some taller things right down the middle of this bed to create a situation where you gotta come over here to see what's on this back line, what's been added to this, another part of the garden back here. So just basically tried to create a room uh, in the back. And this is the perfect plant for it. Again, in this very small garden, you can't have something that gets 12 feet wide to, uh, to accomplish that. And it stayed super narrow. Uh, gonna have great fall color, has great spring, fragrant flowers, uh, just fantastic foliage all season long, uh, and it's not been pruned. I, well, no, it was. One time it was pruned because it had some low limbs on it that needed to come off. So there is one pr 
example of me pruning on the channel a couple years ago, but it was a very small amount of pruning. I didn't do any pruning on the top part of the plant and it looks like this kind of on its own. Number 10 on the list is the plant that's probably uh, the most photographed plant, the most, the plant that's in the background the most uh, in all the videos is this Golden Vols Red Bud. Uh, this thing, the structure of this thing is just absolutely amazing. I'm sh we're shooting this October 2nd, so the leaves are tired. They're about to fall off of it pretty soon. Leafs out very vividly chartreuse in the spring. Blooms, but I don't think it blooms as well as other, uh, other our native red buds. Uh, you know, they tend to have a few more flowers, but it does flower. Uh, those flowers are edible. If you don't know about red buds, you can actually eat the flowers if you're, if you're interested in that. Uh, but it flowers without leaves. So it flowers along the stems and the red buds will flower on the oldest, the absolute oldest wood on the plant. So all the way down the, down the trunk, uh, you'll get flowers, which is really interesting uh, on red buds. They're in the pea family uh, and pea family uh, members are good at producing seed. This one, because it doesn't bloom much, does not, but the regular, our regular native uh, red buds produce lots and lots of seed. They spread themselves far and wide uh, very easily. But this one has the, obviously the weeping habit and there's weeping green form, uh, weeping kind of variegated form, a weeping purple form, and then this is the kind of chartreuse uh, color. One of the things we absolutely love about this plant is the top of it is the, where the birds come and take a break. So there's always birds sitting up here. Frequently there's hummingbird that will sit up there and take a break. Uh, they wait there. We have a bird feeder a little further down and that seems to be the, the waiting spot for the waiting for the larger bird to, to finish up so the small bird can go over there. Uh, it'll lose its leaves in a few weeks. Uh, it root, it limbs all the way down to the ground and occasionally you have to do some pruning on it. It'll spread out across the ground. It doesn't seem to have any negative impact on it, but I kind of like to just kind of keep it where I want to keep it. So I'll occasionally limb it up about two and a half feet off the ground and it just immediately puts limbs right back down uh, to the ground. It is staked. I have found that the growth is so vigorous on this plant and it's so weighted with leaves and it's so, it's just too heavy that the caliper of the tree is never caught up with that. And so it is staked on the inside. You can't see it. When it loses its leaves, I'll move the ties on the stake around so they're not digging into the, uh, it, digging into the trunk. But I think it's going to be on permanent stake. I just, I just do. I don't think that I would ever trust any kind of ice or storm, you know, ice event or heavy wind event, you know, wind in the summer with all this weight on it and ice in the winter with all these individual little limbs on it to carry weight. Uh, so I'd probably just never going to trust it and I'm going to keep it staked, but occasionally move, move the ties on it. But this is definitely the one plant that would never move in the garden. It's just in the perfect location. It has lots of other flowering things around it and other interesting things around it. And it's always a standout in the background. What's the one plant that would definitely, if you were redoing your garden tomorrow, what's the one plant you would definitely not move? Let us know in the comments down below. Thanks for watching.